behind time um, this morning. Thank you. Um, well, today is, is Tree Tuesday. Um, so this is a, a new idea for us in um, Global Botanic Garden Congress is to have a themed day. But as you know, BGCI does a lot with trees. Uh, we have many arboreta within our, uh, our network. Um, and trees, of course, are important at, at all levels. So we think it's going to be a great day. And you, you'll find that uh, when you look at your program that uh, most of the sessions are, are tree-oriented. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, in a second to Jerry Donnelly uh, on my right. Uh, he's the CEO and president of Morton Arboretum. And Morton Arboretum have kindly um, sponsored Tree Tuesday uh, today. Uh, Jerry will chair this session uh, and introduce our next speaker. Jerry. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tree Tuesday. We're delighted to get this uh, focus, the focus of our attention, on trees what one speaker yesterday referred to as long-lived biodiversity. We just call them trees, and so uh, happy day. You know, it's true in the world that trees often don't uh, get the focus of our attention. They're often in the backdrop of, of our land, view of the landscape. And I think it's even true in some cases in uh, science and conservation, that trees as organisms are not necessarily a focal point and so uh, our efforts at the Morton Arboretum and in sponsoring this uh, day, Tree Tuesday, were really designed to bring that focus to trees, the importance that they play, the essential value that they provide, both in our natural and our developed world. And so uh, we, we feel as though by focusing on the science of trees, which we're referring to these days as treeology, trying to be quite literal, and then addressing the challenges that trees face in an uncertain and rapidly changing world. And the rapidity of these changes uh, can outstrip the capacity of long-lived individuals, grounded, rooted as they are, trees, uh, to deal with those changes. So they are among the most susceptible uh, and yet most among the most essential. So we're delighted to have a focal point with a series of sessions uh, themed around uh, tree concerns and interests. And foremost to start our day is this plenary session where Dr. Janine Cavender Barris will be, uh, I think, exciting us with uh, the work that she is doing and the broad perspectives that she is bringing on this focus on trees. Her uh, background is listed in the, your program up in the front. But she's a, a professor at the University of Minnesota in a program of ecology, evolution, and behavior. And she uh, combines in a rather unique way, I think, and you'll see it uh, in her presentation today. And the, it's described here as a combination of uh, phylogenetic and quantitative genetics with the physiology of these organisms and what that means for how communities are sorted out, the dynamic of communities, uh, previously often thought of as static, uh, but not, and then the implications for the evolution of both these trees and these systems. So please help me welcome Dr. Janine Cavender Barris. Thank you, Jerry. It's such an honor to be here, and I thank you for the invitation from BGCI. I'm going to start by taking us to the Panama Canal region, where it's become very clear the importance of trees to humanity. In this region, the canal is critical to global trade. A huge amount of trade goes from Asia directly through to the eastern seaboard and North America, bypassing the long route all the way around South America. The Panama Canal is critical to the economy of Panama. And the Agua Salud team at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute has been trying to understand the consequences of land use change and degraded land 
and the possibilities for restoration to restore ecosystem function and to understand the impacts. So they've, varied, they've looked at different land use changes, they've experimentally altered land, and in particular, they've tried to understand the difference between cattle pastures and forested areas. So pastures, turns out, with their impacted soil, the water runs rapidly over the surface and into the waterways. Whereas in forests, it trickle down, trickles down the stems, in through holes that animals make, into the soil, and the water is stored in the soil rather than running off. They can measure the difference in how much water flows out of these systems with rain gauges. And this turns out to be critical um, information. They worked out that in a particularly rainy year, one of the highest rain years on record, the dams were at full capacity. There are two major dams there. They were at full capacity after a series of major storms. And there was loss of life, there was flooding, but the dams did not break. They calculated that if there had not been trees, 100 million extra tons of water would have hit the dams when they were operating at maximum capacity and most vulnerable. So Jeff Hall, who runs the Agua Salud project, says, without the forest, the dam would have surely blown, and we would not have recently celebrated the opening of the third set of locks, but rather they would still be rebuilding the canal. Billions and billions of dollars in lost revenue and billions to rebuild. The economy of Panama would have been wrecked. So that poignant story is one way that we understand the importance of trees. And here is the Agua Salud tree, uh, team planting trees to restore um, degraded systems down there. So I'm going to present you four key messages today. And the first is really just telling you what you know, that trees are critical to human well-being, but also that different tree lineages provide different services, different contributions to human well-being. The second is that trees that we benefit from the, the most today are consequence of, consequences of legacies from the deep past. And forest diversity, so when many tree species are grown together, there are benefits to ecosystems as well as to people. And finally, if we really want to have a sustainable future, if we really want to manage planet Earth in the face of all the global changes that are going on now, we need to really have knowledge of our trees and we need to continuously monitor them. So let's think about the ecosystem services of trees. Some of these can be readily quantified um, monetarily. Wood products, we're very familiar with those. But also climate regulation. We now have a social cost of carbon and trees are critical to carbon sequestration and storage in their trunks, roots, and in the soils. They also provide food. There's an image of almonds, which are highly valued. And they also remove high quantities of air pollution, particularly um, when, <coughs> when they are in proximity to places where people live. The benefits to humanity can be directly calculated in dollar terms. But there are a number of services that we can't calculate a dollar value for so well. The aesthetic value of trees, if you go to Japan or the eastern United States in the fall, people travel far and wide to see the beautiful autumn leaves. Erosion control is critical, particularly in a time of sea level rise and increasing storms. They're critical for provisioning for wildlife, other trophic levels. And there's a whole series of benefits um, the way they benefit us culturally, spiritually, aesthetically. So I'll tell you a little bit about a study that, uh, or actually a couple of studies that are ongoing in a working group that I've been running through the Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center um, that is a combination of economists, ecologists, and evolutionary biologists. And we've been looking at supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural services of trees, all trees, we have regulating services through photosynthesis, but there's only a few that give us nitrogen fixation. There are a few that give us food, many give us wooden fiber, some are very important for medicines and agroforestry, many are important for carbon storage, but very few, but still critically, are important for bee plants. 
and religious and cultural uses as well. So we've been quantifying all of these services and the plant tree of life. So what you see there is a phylogeny, the tree of life for plants. Each of those triangles is a plant order. I've highlighted those that have a significant number of trees in them. And the colored dots indicate the amount of services in those four categories for particular services. And the main point of showing you this is that different lineages provide us with different services. So there are real hot spots for medicines, for example, and hot spots for nitrogen fixation, hot spots for certain services um, that require us to have many different trees in the tree, tree of life, not just a few. We can't get all of the services we benefit from from just a few trees. We really need the full tree, tree of life um, for the benefits we receive from trees. Unfortunately, we know a great deal about some trees, like Douglas fir, which in the United States is the top lumber tree, and we know a great deal about this particular species of tree, but most species we know actually functionally very little about. So there's a big data gap in our understanding of the function and the services that trees, that individual species of trees provide uh, and the number of species that there are. So this gives you, in the black, the black bars, show you the estimated number of species across, a lat across latitudes on planet Earth. So this is how many species of plants we think we have. And in the white bars, that shows us the number of species that we actually have functional trait information for, from which we can understand the services that those plants and trees provide. So that gap means there's an awful lot of trees we know little about. But that's where bot botanic gardens can be enormously helpful. Because botanic gardens house so many trees, of the 60,000 tree species that we now know are on the planet, almost a third are represented in botanical gardens. So there's a real opportunity here to fill in that data gap based on the living collections. We also know that we are witness to the largest biodiversity crisis since the dinosaurs perished some 65 million years ago. And that diversity loss will mean that we are losing the services of trees. More than 10,000 tree species are threatened globally. That's one in six tree species. And again, almost a third of those are threatened trees are held in botanic gardens. So again, there's an opportunity here for conservation and for uh, efforts that can help maintain the services we gain from these waning tree species. And I'll just remind you that we're in a time of unprecedented change. This is climate temperature, the Earth's temperature going back 5 million years and then 500,000 years, 10,000 years ago, 100 years ago now. And if you look into the future, you see that we're entering into a new climate space Humans have never experienced this before. We are going to be experiencing non-analog climates, whole biome shifts, and that will have real consequences for the trees that provide services to humanity. And if we want to maintain those services, we've got to figure out how to manage our trees and our ecosystem services so that we can continue to benefit from them. In addition to climate, we also have with globalization the movement of exotic pests and pathogens. This is so rampant now, um, all over. It's very easy to see in the US. Uh, a number of disease threats, the woolly adelgid, the emerald ash borer, we have already lost our chestnuts. Now there are a series of threats hitting the oaks. I've been studying lately oak wilt, Ceratocystis phagocerium. It's a fungus that causes red oaks to, to die rapidly and white oaks a little more slowly. And it's creating these skeletons across the landscape. The oak tree in my backyard just died this year. So let me take you back to these four services that we can quantify in monetary terms. And what we've done is in the United States where we have a very thorough inventory of all of the forests across the US, we can actually quantify the dollar value of every single tree species. And so for these four services, wood products, carbon storage, food, and air pollution removal, 
we can look at those in monetary terms. So I've mapped them here on a phylogeny. Here's wood production. And the main thing you see here is that not all species contribute equally to that ecosystem service. There are a few, like Douglas fir, that give us an enormous amount of service, and then, and then there are others that give us service, and many that we really don't use for wood production. If we go to carbon storage, you'd think that every tree would be relevant, and it is, but some species are much more important for carbon storage because they're more abundant or they store more car carbon, they have denser wood, and so there's an uneven distribution of where we're getting our carbon storage services uh, across the phylogeny of trees in the United States. And then if we look at the threats to those, to those species, they are also unevenly distributed. Some of the species are, under, are going to be under much greater stress from drought going forward than others. And if we look at disease, the frightening thing is that some of the most some of our most important trees for these services are under the greatest threats. Oh, I, wanted, I want to take you back in time shortly, but first point out that we can look which, at which genera are the most valuable for these four ecosystem services in dollar terms. And so it turns out the oaks in the US are the most valuable tree genus, followed by the pines. Uh, and I want to explain why that is. It really has to do with the fact that oaks have the highest biomass and are the most diverse woody genus in the US. This is also the case for Mexico. So they're also highest biomass and most diverse in Mexico. Why is that? So here's where we can, we can learn a lot by going back in deep time. And so I've been collaborating with a team of oak researchers in the US and Mexico. This is a project led by Andrew Hipp at the Morton Arboretum and we've been trying to understand the deep history of the oaks in the Americas. And let me first remind you that the Earth's climate has changed dramatically through time. This is a very deep time scale showing you how temperature has changed through time, CO2 has declined rapidly through time. My students are always surprised when they learn that yes, CO2 was really very much higher a long time ago and the temperature was much warmer on planet Earth. The biomes that we had 90 million years ago were quite different. We had a tropical Earth then. And as tectonic activity started to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperatures fell, tropical dry forest emerged. Became the rainfall patterns changed and uh, seasonality emerged. Then came the temperate forests as the climate cooled some 40 million years ago. And when the temperate forest biome started to emerge, when the climate became ripe for that, it, the tropical taxes started to die off. And that opened up ecological space that allowed those lineages that were ready to go, that were pre-adapted to those climates to move in and expand and diversify. Then came the deserts, the savanna and grasslands, Mediterranean, and tundra, very recently, in fact. And so the oaks emerged, they came from high latitudes, and they descended to lower latitudes at the time when the earth was cooling some 30 to 40 million years ago. They had what it took. And the interesting thing is that there were two major lineages, or actually four lineages that are quite distinct, but two which were deciduous, that had developed the deciduous habit expanded quite rapidly early on, and they did so in parallel. They split around the, ro walky, the Rocky Mountains, going both west and east. And then they further diversified in the east, and both of those major lineages, the red oaks and the white oaks, did so in parallel. And then they moved southward into Mexico as the volcanic activity increased and mountains rose there and accelerated their evolution. So that is the story of the oaks that were opportunistic in taking advantage of dying tropical taxa as the biome shifted and rapidly diversifying in parallel. They got there first, they expanded first, and they took over. That's how the oaks took over America. And you can see they did so in parallel if you look at their broad distributions, but that's really unique to the Americas. In Europe, only the white oaks made it back over to Europe. The red oaks didn't. 
And if we look, again, just in the US, j using forest inventory data, and we look at the evolution of functional traits, so what I'm showing you are the two major lineages, red oaks and white oaks, and their climatic niches, their mean climatic niches in terms of minimum temperature. What I'm showing you there is highly convergent evolution in their climatic niches. And on the bottom, I'm showing you a specific leaf area, or the area per unit weight, and again, high convergence between these two major lineages and their function, showing that these two lineages were basically doing, they were adaptively radiating into many, many different ecological niches and doing so simultaneously in parallel, probably facilitating each other. So again, this helps tell the story of how the oaks came to dominate North America. I'll tell you another story now. Now we'll move to the live oaks, which are not one of the major lineages. They're a small lineage. They're a lineage of evergreen oaks. They have thick, leathery leaves, and all of them do, this small lineage of seven species. And they, some million years ago, made their way, in the southern distribution is in Costa Rica, in the seasonally dry tropical forest there. They're very interesting species from the perspective of tropical dry forest because they're evergreen, where most species are deciduous. They have seeds that are not desiccation tolerant. They're not able to um, go dormant. And they're ectomycorrhizal instead of arbuscular mycorrhizal. So that has really large ecosystem consequences. So here's the deciduous tropical dry forest, what, it, what most species looks like, look like. And here are the oak forests. They produce seeds, very different kinds of seeds that feed numerous animals, so they are, they are providing for, other, for trophic, other trophic levels in a way that the deciduous species are not. They are changing the flora, the microbial flora below ground in a way the other species are not. And they also change the microclimate. They cool the local environment, creating habitat during the long severe dry season that doesn't exist in the, in the deciduous forest. So all of these, this legacy from the past, these, this evergreenness that evolved elsewhere and dispersed itself down into the tropical dry forest, this oak was able to persist because it has deep roots, but it's functionally quite distinct and it creates a different ecosystem function. And that's important to remember when we think of on the same climatic and geologic setting, we can get really different functions from different trees. We can think about this on a global level. So if we look at the top map here, we see that those are climate classifications across the globe, and there are consistent climates on, all, on the many different continents. And the bottom panel shows two ecosystem functions, net primary productivity and nitrogen fixation. And I'm gonna highlight three places that have very similar climatic backgrounds but very different ecosystem functions. So look at South America and Asia, for example, very similar climates but they have very different productivity levels. And we could actually test whether those differences in function have to do with evolutionary legacies from the deep past because different species got there, different species are there, and they have different functions. So I just wanted to take you on a trip through the past so you could have some context for thinking about managing planet Earth now and how we actually undertake restoration and how do we actually create ecosystems that have the functions we need for sustainability, given that we can have different functions on the same geologic setting? The last story from the past I'm gonna tell you is about Quercus brandegii, an endangered species that we can reconstruct a story about how it has responded to past climate change. This species has been hypothesized by Muller back in the 1960s that it used to cover a vast area, that it used to um, cover across Mexico and the southwestern US. Now, however, it's found way down in this desert. When you look at this, it does not look like the habitat for oak. You have to go way down in that valley to find the oaks, and the only place they are is uh, uh, in this ephemeral riverbed where most of the time it's bone dry and it's just hugging the edges of that river, and it's able to sustain the population because of these cyclone tracks, because it, you know, a few times a year, water will rush in there and, they, and the population can be maintained. 
but it's a small population and it's just clinging to the one microhabitat where it can still survive. Now, Muller hypothesized that it and uh, uh, Quercus fusiformis, the Texas live oak, or if you're from Mexico, you'll call it something else. Um, that species, Muller hypothesized, was its sister taxa, and together they once, there was an ancestral species that once covered this whole area. So we've used molecular data to test that hypothesis. And we do find that some five million years ago, Quercus brandigii split from Quercus fusiformis from a common ancestor. Interestingly, the timing of that split matches with the inception of the Sea of Cortez, which separated Baja California from the mainland of California. So that was a vicarious event that um, likely split those species, but it also corresponds with the deepening of the drying of planet Earth and the expansion of the desert biome and of Mediterranean biomes around the Earth. And so what very likely has happened is that this oak species that once had plenty of habitat has now been relegated, basically trapped down in this valley where it can't get out. So it's a red-listed uh, endangered species. And because there's a high amount of niche conservatism, these oaks didn't adapt to the desert. We can't really expect trees to adapt. It's had five million years to try to adapt and it's really just clinging on to this one microhabitat. And that's a general lesson for us to consider that trees are not going to adapt as biomes shift. They're going to cling to the microhabitats where they can still survive. So maybe botanical gardens can help them evolve more rapidly, but more likely we're, out, we're probably going to have to do things to get them out of the places where they're stuck so that they can get to places where they can survive. So we've also timed, we've used molecular data and, and mathematical models to figure out if Muller's hypothesis was correct. And um, it turns out that yes, the ancestor was much larger in size than the two daughter species, which supports the hypothesis that it was once a broad, widespread species and is now um, two smaller span species with Brandigia, a very tiny population. So, I want to mention then that botanical gardens are intervening in cases like this. The Oaks of the Americas Conservation Network, which there are a number of people in that network here today, are working to save this species, to study it and do ex situ conservation on endangered species like Quercus brandigii and others in Mexico that are threatened. And I want to move from here now and talk about tree diversity itself. So I've just told you that there are different benefits from different trees, different lineages of trees. We, we benefit from the different functions of different trees. And because of that, when you grow more species of trees together, ecosystem function itself is enhanced relative to when you grow individual species alone. And so um, that idea is captured in the Convention on Biodiversity in which they concluded that the available scientific evidence strongly supports the conclusion that the capacity of forests to resist change or recover following disturbance is dependent on biodiversity at multiple scales. So let me take you through some of the scientific evidence that's been emerging. And I'll mention that for decades now, scientists have been studying the effects of biodiversity on ecosystem function. This is uh, one of the most famous biodiversity experiments. It happens to be in Minnesota, where I'm from, set up by David Tillman uh, 25 years ago. And it varies plant, herbaceous plant diversity in a grassland system and looks at a whole suite of ecosystem functions, including productivity, which is on the y-axis. Those different colors show you different years of the experiment. So the x-axis is planted richness, and that red line on the bottom tells you the relationship between productivity and richness. There's an increase in productivity with richness, but it's a shallow slope. Then as we go, that's the first year of the experiment. As we go into the second year, it gets much steeper. As we go into subsequent years, it gets even steeper. And then after 15 years, there's really an enormous increase in productivity with planted richness, which also indicates that as we lose richness, we lose ecosystem function. So people who study trees 
have then wondered, is this also true for forest systems? And that has been a nagging question in my field. And people finally decided to do something about it. So in the last decade, Tree DivNet has emerged as a global network of tree diversity experiments across the globe, um, started in Europe, spread rapidly to the Americas and everywhere. And these are systems of tree diversity experiments very similar to the grassland experiments that occurred earlier. Still increasing, 43 partners, 120 publications and growing. Here is one of the networks within the tree div network, IDENT, and this is from um, an experiment in Freiburg, Germany. And we have a matching experiment, a set of experiments in Minnesota. And here is from one of the IDENT experiments in Minnesota where my students are working. These are, re this are results from a graduate student showing that as you increase species richness, you get increases in productivity or over yielding, which is the amount of additional productivity you get beyond what you'd expect for individual species. So we're starting to see the same thing in forests that we saw in grasslands. This is uh, slides from my German colleagues showing in forest inventories for different age stands. Again, you see increases in basal area with tree species richness, increases in growth with tree species richness. And in a global study that came out looking at um, all the global forest inventory records that are available globally, we see the same relationship that we saw in grasslands where productivity increases with relative species richness. And the biodiversity effect, which you can see in the bottom graph, is strongest at higher latitudes in seasonal environments. So why is this? So a number of studies are coming out now trying to explain the mechanisms uh, through the use of these experiments. So we know that there's canopy packing. When you put different species that do different things together, they're able to harvest more total light and produce more total biomass. They're also more resilient and they change below ground dynamics as well. This is, a, this is a study that a student I co-advised with Peter Reich uh, just published this year showing that plasticity is part of the answer. So on the left, you see paper birch when it's grown by itself, and then in the middle, paper birch when it's grown with red oak, and then on the right, paper birch when it's grown with white pine. So it shifts the structure of its crown depending on its neighbors, and in that manner, the trees in a multi-species system are able to harvest more light than any species does alone when it's grown with uh, like species, conspecifics. We can also look at pest control, the benefits of tree diversity for reducing herbivory and damage from pests. This is a study that uh, same grad student, Jay Grossman, is just about to submit, showing for eight different tree species that as the phylogenetic diversity of trees or the diversity of trees increases, the amount of leaf damage decreases. And that finding is consistent across many, many studies that on the whole show that lower tree species diversity re results in greater insect pest abundance, density, or damage, and that higher div diversity reduces pest damage. So, because different species do different things, no species, no single species can capture as many resources and do as many things as when there are many species grow, growing together. So tree diversity enhances ecosystem function. <clears throat> I've shown you a number of slides showing we get higher productivity, and that's in part to complementarity, because species enhance each other's growth more than they enhance conspecific growth. And there's also less pest damage. It's harder for pests to find their favorite species when they're growing in a multitude of different species. So now I'm going to go to the last part, the last key message, which is that if we're going to do a good job of stewarding planet Earth for sustainability, if we're, <laughs> if we're going to actually try to make it through this era of global change and meet human needs, we need to know our trees and we need to continuously monitor them. 
Managing requires monitoring. And so what a number of us have been calling for is a continuous global mission to detect changes in the functions and functional diversity of plants and trees. So basically a satellite mission. Let me tell you more about that. So a wor the work that many of you have done, that many that I have done and many of my colleagues have done is laborious and limited. We study biodiversity. We look at phylogenetic relationships using molecules. We look at functional uh, data about trees. And we look at species distributions. That is all critical information, but it's hard to do it repeatedly and continuously, and it's hard to do it in places that are dangerous or difficult to access. Luckily, technology has been advancing rapidly. We now have hyperspectral sensors that allow us to get spectra, reflectance spectra, from leaves and canopies of plants that tell us a whole lot about their function and can be remotely sensed. So here's just showing you that anything that interacts with light is revealed in the spectral profile that we can detect from leaves and canopies of plants. Their chemical structure, their anatomical structure, their color, anything your eye can see, but we're moving from 400 nanometers all the way to 2,500 nanometers, which is your, your eye has three bands. Here we have hundreds and hundreds of bands. So we have many-fold the information that your eye can capture. And from that, we can get detailed information about the function and now it looks like the location in the tree of life from these spectra. Here, this is a postdoc in my lab, Anna Schweiger, and she's showing how you can take those spectra and with high accuracy predict a whole suite of functional traits. Carbon content, nitrogen content, cellulose, lignin, and a whole suite of pigments and other functional traits. So we can get functional traits from spectra. And so the idea is to have a satellite mission using hyperspectral sensors that capture functional traits continuously around the globe. They're ideal for picking up trees, combining that with the in-situ biodiversity information that we're already collecting, that you're already collecting, that botanical gardens can really help with. Let me tell you a little bit more about linking spectra to the tree of life. So we tried this idea of seeing if the hierarchical organization of plants could allow us to place spectra in the tree of life. First took an experiment I had running in Honduras with multiple genotypes of a single species to see if we could use spectra to differentiate those populations. And then we looked at different species within the oak genus, and then at different clades within that genus. And what we find in this graph, we find that we can significantly detect differentiate populations with spectra, but not necessarily with the traits that we get from spectra. We can even more accurately differentiate species, but again, we do so much better with the spectra than with the traits we get from spectra, because species, many species have very similar traits, but their spectra are quite distinct. And when we go to clades, when we go to lineages, we really have high accuracy in differentiating clades. So that means maybe we can't differentiate populations or species sometimes, but we're probably going to be able to do a really good job at differentiating clades. And so the idea is to take an unknown spectra. That if we fly over or send a satellite over, we can get spectra. And because of that profile and the information within that spectrum, the hundreds and hundreds of bands that we obtain from that, we can, with some probability, place that spectrum in the tree of life. So I've been running a working group through the National Institute for Mathematical Biology and Synthesis with the world's best remote sensing folks who use this hyperspectral information. And we've built a database for leaf spectra from plants collected where you see in red. And postdoc uh, Jose Eduardo Mareles has been leading this effort. And the graph below, you see something very interesting that at the longer wavelengths, well beyond where your eye can see, the short wave infrared, that part of the spectrum is highly conserved phylogenetically. So things your eye can't see give us the secret to figuring out where in the tree of life a plant is based on its ref light reflectance. 
So the idea is to build a library of leaf spectra, but we'd really like to do this for canopies because that's what the satellite will see. We have a library of spectral profiles. We have species distribution data on the ground, the things that should be there, the, the species and lineages that we think should be there. And we can continuously monitor to see how those spectral profiles are changing and where in the tree of life those likely are. So that's the vision. Botanical gardens become really critical here because botanical gardens would allow scientists to develop spectral profiles for whole canopies, which is what we really need for remote sensing, not just leaf level spectra, but whole canopy spectra. This is showing for the Americas using BGCI's garden search, the number of botanical gardens that are in the Americas alone. And I've pulled out the Arnold Arbor Arboretum, an image from the Arnold Arboretum. And every single tree you see in that image is tagged. We have a source for it. We know in detail the species. And if you were to fly over there and get the spectral profiles for all those trees, you would be on your way to starting to build a library of spectral profiles of canopies. And then if we think about the 3,000 gardens globally and all the trees that are housed in those gardens, we begin to imagine how we could actually continuously monitor the trees on planet Earth. So global botanical gardens maintain almost 17,000 of the 60,000 known tree species, 4,370 genera. That's about a third of the total tree species on the Earth. And even better, 240 out of 267 uh, plant families that have trees in them. So about 90% of the tree plant families. So if we could build spectral profiles of the different families, we would get about 90%. And then we're on our way to having a way to monitor the Earth's functional forest diversity. So I want to leave you with that thought. I have, um, I have endeavored to give you four key messages. The trees are important to humanity. The different tree lineages give us different things and that where we're getting our benefits now are legacies of the deep past, and it's also likely to change with the threats that trees are facing. That when we grow many species together, we get more function than when we grow species individually. And that if we really want to manage our planet for sustainability, we need to understand our trees better, and we need to continuously monitor them. And in all of these areas, botanical gardens have a really important role to play. So I'm going to thank sponsors and collaborators, BGCI in particular, and leave you with a plug for Tree Tuesday. So this, this uh, talk, an outstanding talk, Janine, Thank you so much. We'll be followed immediately by a panel addressing, uh, taking that context and considering uh, our challenge and opportunities related to the conservation of trees as Jeanine set up, Janine set up. And so uh, while that panel comes up, uh, which, is, which is scheduled now, please, please come forward to the uh, forward table. And we'll, uh, while they do that, we might have a question, a time for a question or two for Janine. Questions, please. Chipper. Thank you. Thank you, Chipper Wickman, National Tropical Botanical Garden. Thank you for incredible talk. Can you talk a little bit about the work Greg Asner and the Car Ca Ca Carnegie Platform and how it plays into your research? Yeah, so Greg is actually part of this project and all of the all of the data that coming from South America is coming from Greg. Um, so Greg really pioneered this whole area and, but he's been, able to, he's been able to produce quite a lot with his own instruments and his own team, but that doesn't get us to global. To get to global, we need everybody working together. And so that's what we're starting to do. We're building a big network of people that are using the same technology as Greg. Um, the biggest problem of working together has been that instruments don't read spectra the same way. 
And so one of the hardest challenges that we're grappling with right now, but it's actually working, is to develop algorithms that allow different instruments to read the spectra the same way and to reconcile spectra from different systems so that we can actually take a spectrum from Greg, Greg's lab and compare it to one from Michel, Michel, Michel Shapeman or from Phil Townsend or John Gammon or my lab so that we can actually, or Susan Houston, put all these spectra together in a, in a common library that tell us the same thing. So that's a challenge I didn't mention that we're working on right now, but it's going really well. So I think we're gonna be able to do this. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, and it's it just listening to you, it, appear, it just comes to my mind that as if you move to the satellite, you've got a common piece of equipment monitoring the whole globe, so you've, you've solved that problem. Yeah, so when we move to satellite, um, that's right. We, we do away with the instrument problem, but we still have to, in order to use the information that we get from airborne data and uh, other kinds of flyover data, we need to still reconcile those instruments and we also have the, pi the pixel size issue, which I did not mention, but you know, from satellite, you're gonna get much larger pixel sizes, so you get, a, you get a spectrum in every pixel. And if you're covering, if you're covering more than one tree, then you're gonna get mixed spectra that give us, you're gonna get multiple s tree species in the same spectrum, and then you have to do all kinds of mathematical tricks to uncouple those. So there's, there's real complexity here, but there is not complexity in retrieving the functional traits. And if the pixel sizes can be small enough and you can have groves of trees that are similar enough, the idea should work. And we can also use mixing models. So there are many, there are many pieces to this puzzle. One of them is developing spectral libraries for tree canopies we get those, we're moving a long way forward. But I, I'm not saying this is gonna be easy. So um, there may be other questions, I know that there will be, uh, of Janine. And although she was not originally scheduled to be part of this panel, if you are willing, Janine, will you stay with the group? Yeah. And uh, there'll be opportunities for other questions and discussions. 